If you're looking for one of the most opulent luxury vehicles you can buy for 2023, or you just wanna see what it looks like in person, then follow me along as I take a look at the all new Range Rover. This is the biggest, most luxurious, and in a way, the greenest Range Rover ever conceived because this generation was designed for plug-in hybrids and a full EV version that's gonna be on sale probably in about a year after you're watching this video. Now, what is a Range Rover? Well, back in 1969, Land Rover or Rover, they basically decided that they needed something a little bit more off-road capable with a nice interior, permanent four-wheel drive, but something that was very comfortable for rougher road situations. Say if you had a country estate or you lived in Australia in the outback and you had enough cash to be able to afford one, that's how the Range Rover was conceived. In a way, it was sort of the British version of the Wagoneer. And things, of course, have come full circle because now we consider things like the Grand Cherokee the American Range Rover. If you're not overly familiar with the Land Rover lineup, you might mistake this for the previous model, but this is a complete clean sheet redesign for the Range Rover, but it still looks like a member of the family. Obviously it has Range Rover spelled out really prominently right there on the hood, Land Rover badge right there. We have full LED headlights in all models and the shapes are pretty consistent with the previous generation, but you'll notice that they're all massaged on this generation. It's much sleeker, much smoother. This really looks kind of like a concept vehicle in terms of the way they've integrated components like the headlights, the grille, etc. This all is very, very flat up front really lending itself to better aerodynamics. This has a coefficient of drag of 0.30, very, very low for a big boxy SUV. That's gonna be really important for the upcoming electric version and of course the plug-in hybrid model that you should be able to order right around now. When you really get in close and look at the elements that make up the front of the Range Rover, you'll notice what I'm talking about. The headlight blends almost seamlessly with this portion of the grill, then the grill elements right there, they're all on the same level. Expect the full electric Range Rover model probably to have a blanked out grill because not a lot of cooling is required, and you'll see that the hood really just swoops right on down there at the same level as that bumper. If you're the kind of person that's impressed by panel gaps and build quality, then you should definitely take a look at a Range Rover in person. Everything here is impeccably aligned, and that's really good because it simply would not work with this design if it was any other way. You'll see how these body panels curve up here to the glass section of the body. If any of these were misaligned, it would look pretty funny, and the way the seams are all done, also, again, it would look pretty funny. So, impeccable build quality. This one has the optional bicolor roof. That is a pretty pricey option. And speaking of pricey options, this white paint is also fantastically expensive. How expensive, you might be wondering? Well, this optional paint job on this model cost nearly $20,000. Of course, pretty expensive wheels are found on this model as well. 23 inch rollers here and you can get your Range Rover in two sizes just as before 198.9 inches long or this extended wheelbase version at 207 inches long this is one of the largest vehicles you can buy in America that has only four seats on the inside yep just two seats in the back but it also is the first time that there has ever been a three-row Range Rover so if you're looking for a Range Rover competitor to a Mercedes-Benz GLS or a BMW X7 there's finally one available for you. It's the extended base format, but we have a third row in the back rather than the supersized second row that we find in this model. So for those that are counting, you can get your Range Rover with four seats, five seats, or seven seats. Five seats is gonna be the least expensive way to get your Range Rover. Seven seats is next, and you're gonna pay the most for the least number of seats. If you're thinking that the Range Rover lineup has some conflicting priorities, you're not necessarily wrong. This is undoubtedly a very off-road capable vehicle at its core. 35.4 inches of water fording capability, nearly three feet of still water. As long as it's not moving, you can just tootle right on through. 11.6 inches of maximum ground clearance, thanks to the standard adaptive air suspension system, four wheel steering in this model, and standard permanent all wheel drive with a locking differential in the rear, two speed transfer case, and locking center coupling. This is very, very capable, but it also has 23 inch tires and wheels on it with very little cushion for off-roading. So clearly you'd have to swap those out. Also, not too many people are gonna be off-roading in their quarter million dollar SUV. And that's where the divergent priority for Range Rover comes in. You see, historically, especially in Europe, Range Rovers were very often the driveway companions to Rolls-Royce and Bentley sedans. Because if you had a lot of cash and you had a place in the country, you'd take your Range Rover there, or your Range Rover might live in the country, and in the city, you'd have that Rolls-Royce or the Bentley. But now Rolls-Royce and Bentley have SUVs. So in order to counter that and keep up, 
we have to have a more expensive Range Rover. And that's the model I'm taking a look at today. This is the SV trim. This is the almost completely decked out model. MSRP in this one, $255,000. And uh, yeah, you can put another $10,000 of options on it if you want to. The most striking design feature on the rear of the Range Rover is this big black ring that circles the rear. When the taillights are off, it is a complete black ring, and then when the taillights are on, it appears sort of broken with the taillight modules. Now, sadly, in the United States, we get red turn signals rather than the amber ones that they find in Europe. And we still have a classic Range Rover touch here where we have a hatch and then we have a tailgate right there. This is a really cool touch that I love and not too many SUVs offer anymore. If this had an opening glass, it would probably be the holy grail of SUVs. And they will close in a synchronized fashion with that one button right there. At the bottom, we have a tow hitch because this will tow up to 8,200 pounds when properly equipped. Base towing capacity comes in at 5,500 pounds. That was interestingly one of the original missions of the Range Rover. They wanted you to be able to seat some passengers, have enclosed cargo for those wetter climates, and of course, still be able to tow like a pickup truck. As you'd expect out of a vehicle with a price tag that spans over $100,000, there are a number of different engine options in the Range Rover. The base model is gonna get a three liter inline six mild hybrid. We've seen this in other Land Rover products before. It produces 395 horsepower, 406 pound-feet of torque, and will give you 21 miles per gallon. They're calling that the P400 trim. Available for order right around now, right around the time you're watching this video, is the P440e. That is the plug-in hybrid version of the Range Rover. There have been some pretty significant improvements with that model. It uses the same basic inline-six engine, bumps power all the way up to 434 horsepower, 457 horsepower, thanks to a 139 horsepower electric motor. It has a much bigger battery this year, giving an EPA estimated range of around 51 miles. That's the latest number that I have from Land Rover. That's thanks to a 31.8 kilowatt hour battery pack, and it's gonna be one of the few plug-in hybrids you could DC fast charge if you're so inclined. Then there's this engine right here, the one that everybody is interested in. This is a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8 engine. This is kind of sort of a joint venture between Land Rover and BMW. Basically the joint venture part was Land Rover had the cash, they paid BMW and said, hey, would you take your twin turbo V8 engine, make some tweaks for off-roading duty, including a different oil sump, so that way it had better oiling characteristics when off-roading, few other changes to make it fit under this hood, etc. And they've given it a dipstick if that's what you're interested in. In. This engine produces 523 horsepower, 553 pound-feet of torque, and it is significantly more fuel efficient in the real world than the outgoing 5-liter V8. They're calling this one the P530. Coming in about a year, perhaps 18 months, we're going to get a full battery electric version of the Range Rover, but at this point, we don't have any specifications on that model just yet. No opulent luxury car would be complete without big cushy seats, so of course we find those inside with tons and tons of adjustability. We have an inflatable shoulder section, front seat massage, extending thigh cushion, three position memory over there, four-way power headrest, and of course, memory-linked powered tilt telescopic steering column. In fact, all four seating positions in here are all three position memory linked. Unfortunately, I have to admit, I don't find this driver's seat quite as comfortable as some of the less expensive competition. I do find the seats in the GLS and the X7 a little bit more comfortable. If you've spent any time in this Range Rover generation, I would love to hear from you in the comment section. Let me know if it's just me. I think that the seat bottom cushion, I wish it was just a little bit more adjustable in terms of the tilt. I think that would solve the problem. The front of this cushion just feels a little bit low and there's really no way to just change that position for me. It is very adjustable just not quite enough for me however other people that I've had in the vehicle for a few hours they didn't have any problem at all with the essentially identical passenger seat so again it could just be me now it's time to start exploring the crazy features like the fact that this is a long wheelbase four seat vehicle I have power controls over here on the door also some touchscreen controls right here in the center for controlling this seat. Now, if you want the ultimate in seat control, you wanna be on the passenger side because of course that front passenger seat will move all the way forward, giving you even an ottoman there that I don't have here. I just have a leg rest on this side. I don't have anything that flips out from the driver's seat. On the other hand, I have absolutely insane amounts of legroom. You can see this front seat's comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall. Plenty of room right back here. I can even be getting a massage while we're talking about this. And that's because this long wheelbase version of the Range Rover the entire stretch goes right back here to the back seat. We don't really get any extra cargo area, so that 207 inch length, it's all about the back seat. 
It's also all about the crazy excessive touches back here. Obviously, we have screens in the seat backs, power peasant shades there on the door, those memory controls and seat controls. You can control the power shades, things like that. Also, the shade for this large panoramic moonroof. I am a little bit sad that it doesn't go a little further back, but you'll notice that the ceiling is stitched leather. It's not Alcantara or anything like that. This is a 100% leather interior. Many, many cows gave their life for this, including the leather right there on the headrest backs, the leather on the seat back there. We also have some really cool touches in here. I'll talk about this a bit more, but this is actually a ceramic top for these sections right here. It's difficult to see, but there's actually a pattern going on in the ceramic. So that's not wood, that's actually ceramic. You can, of course, get wood if you want to. And uh, here's what's going on there. That is actually a powered tray table there for the second row. So you pop that up, you can use that storage space there. You can also unfurl these little guys right like that. Use that as a tray table. I can also power open and close the cup holders. So you can see this little section right there that pops out and then the cup holders pop up. That's a really elegantly done dance. We also have some storage going on right here under this area. Qi wireless charging mat, of course. Larger storage console going on right there in the middle. And then behind it all, we have exactly what you'd expect in a high-end luxury vehicle, a fridge with a place to store your champagne and your two champagne flutes because you wouldn't want hot champagne flutes. That simply would not do. Behind that, we have even more leather. You can see that even the backs of these rear seat backs, those are all covered in leather. And that Tanu cargo cover that is powered, that's also, you guessed it, leather. The leather app even extends to portions of the interior that you don't normally think about, like these sections between the seats and the door. And then of course, there's some other fabrics going on right there on the side of the seat, so that way it doesn't squeak. For the audio files in the crowd, we don't just get speakers on the rear doors, we also get speakers on the front seat backs. There's speakers in the ceiling of the cargo area, in the hatch, there's a subwoofer back there, and yep, even surround sound speakers in the rear headrests. Behind the second row seats, we find just over 40 cubic feet of cargo capacity in the short wheelbase and the long wheelbase two row models. That's because this area of the vehicle doesn't really change. They simply pull the rear seats rearward and stretch the vehicle in the middle. If you get the seven passenger version, then we get just under 18 cubic feet of cargo capacity behind the third row. Then of course you can fold them down and get approximately 40 cubic feet of storage space still. In my 24 inch roller bag test, I was only able to fit four 24 inch roller bags back here because of some of the tighter dimensions involving that massaging powered rear seat unit. And of course the refrigerator in the back, it does take up a lot of room, but we still have a full size spare tire. And lest you think it's all impractical giggles, I did discover something surprising. You can actually fold that one seat back down. This doesn't exactly make it go flat, but it does make this more practical than most vehicles with this kind of throne arrangement in the back. So on Jeeves day off, you can send them over to Ikea and get some flat pack furniture for your college kids. The rear tailgate and load floor combined to give you some stadium style seating. You know, if you want to watch Bunty at the polo. And then over here on this side, we can raise or lower the rear air suspension because I wouldn't want my feet dangling in the air when I'm sitting back here on the back of my Range Rover. How exactly you feel about this interior is going to depend on your concept of luxury and modernity. Up here we have the controls for that large panoramic moonroof, again the leather stitched ceiling, dual sun visors, fabric on the insides so that way they don't squeak, leather on the outsides so that way it matches everything. One weird twist, fixed height shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. That's something that I had not expected. Here's a different view of that reclining rear seat back. And in case you're wondering, the driver can control everything. So I can go over here to this chauffeur mode and I can reset all seats. One rather unexpected twist about that rear passenger seat is that although I can control all the seats from the infotainment system as the driver, if that one seat is collapsed in that manner, then for some reason I can no longer control it. Taking a look back up here at the front seats, you can see lots of different stitching and patterns. This is not a, uh, a perforation, this is actually a stitch going on right there in that section. The shoulder section of the seat is inflatable. We have four-way adjustable headrest with the sort of butterfly thing going on there. Lots and lots of premium materials going on in here and a classic Land Rover favorite, separate armrests. This model has the rather expensive optional ceramic controls, so these little knobs on the seat are ceramic, they're not white plastic. 
Speaking of that particular option, in this SV trim with the ceramic options, etc., we don't get wood, we get all of these little bits, but in some of the trims you can combine some of the ceramic controls with wood inserts. This is a composite material here in the door because if it was ceramic it would shatter in a side impact and they don't want that. We have the controls for the seats with the memory buttons integrated right there into the controls. More controls are in the infotainment system. One interesting twist, that's the door handle right over there just above that door lock and unlock. It's kind of integrated into that little module. Over here on the dashboard, it is definitely similar to the outgoing model in the general style. We have an upper glove compartment right there with a power port inside, and then we have a lower glove compartment right there. This strip is the same sort of composite material we find over there on the door, and there's lots of ambient lighting going on. It's here deliberately, so that way the ambient lighting actually reflects off of it to give you a different uh, vibe in the cabin. Center channel speaker right up there, air vents. This does have the heated windshield, of course. Then we have this touchscreen infotainment system very front and center. This interior was designed to be minimalist and modern, but I do find this screen just a tiny bit small for the price tag of the vehicle. Also, we don't have the option of a passenger screen. Maybe that's gonna come at some later date. Here are the controls for all the seats, so I can go over here and control the passenger seat. I can command a memory setting. I can click over there to that particular seat, command its memory setting, for instance, etc. Go over to massage, control the front and rear seat massage, really handy with all that. We do have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's wireless in nature and it occupies almost the entire screen. You can see that this portion of the screen is reserved for some of those system functions. And then over here on this side, we have touchscreen access to the 360 degree camera, the automated parking system, vehicle settings, etc. Controls for the climate control down here. This is a four zone climate control system. These knobs do double duty as climate control zone controllers and then I push them in to control seat heating and seat ventilation. There's a direct access button to some of those seat functions that we don't have to work through the software. This software looks somewhat similar to the previous generations of Land Rover software but it is definitely different. The most obvious difference is the responsiveness of the system. It is much, much more responsive. I also like the way they've done the haptic feedback in the system. It's pretty aggressive haptic feedback. It can be adjusted, but it really lets you know you have actually selected that particular option. It clicks very loudly. Moving down from there, we find ceramic sections here. This has a pattern in it, just like you saw in the rear. It's a little bit difficult, again, to see in this lighting, but there's the pattern right there in the ceramic. Uh, it definitely has a different feel to it versus plastic. It's also likely gonna scratch a lot less than the plastics that we find in a lot of vehicles out there, especially versus piano black plastic. Moving in there, we have a joystick style shifter. There's an unlock button on the back. This section opens to reveal the cup holders. I kinda wish that was powered like the rear one. This one opens to reveal a charging mat right there, storage area with a USB port. We can then move those cup holders out of the way, have access to a deep storage spot, two USB inputs right there, toss the phone over there, and then we have access to a cooler up front. Obviously, this is gonna be different based on the model you get, so this one has two fridges, one for the front and one for the back. On the driver's side, we find a full color heads up display and of course, a full color LCD instrument cluster. This is not a rectangular LCD, which is interesting. It has chamfered corners, which I think looks really attractive and it sort of floats above the dashboard, kind of like the infotainment system over there. We have the knob for adjusting the steering wheel on the right side of the steering column, because of course this was designed for a British audience as well. And lots of attention to detail, including this section right here is actually stitched leather. If I move over here, you can see that there's lots of attention to detail with that stitch section right there. And then the only kind of plastic bit we find is that little baffle because of course the steering column has to move up and down and in and out. Speaking of that instrument cluster, there are several different layouts. This is the multi-dial layout. Things are adjusted with this control over here on this side. We can then choose between three basic layouts. There's an all map view. Sadly, this does not have satellite imagery like we find available in some Audi products. And then it has the focused view, which I think is the more modern and more attractive layout where you can actually choose what's going on in different sections of that display. Moving out from there, we have metal shift paddles. We have the controls for that multifunction instrument cluster over here. Press that button and that turns into a four-way selector. Otherwise, it's gonna be things like track forward, backward. This one is the rotary volume knob for the infotainment system. Then we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system and heated steering wheel over on the right side. The airbag cover is leather, just as you would expect. Big Range Rover logo right there. 
But one thing that did surprise me is this plastic section on the steering wheel. They have to do that for safety, of course, rather than making it a metal insert. But I kind of wish that had been something a little bit different, maybe just perforated leather or just a different kind of finish to dress it up a little bit. Since the roads are pretty wet out here, I'm not going to be demonstrating the zero to 60 time, but I think that's okay because it's not really fitting with the personality of the full-on Range Rover. If you're after a more dynamic driving experience, there's the Range Rover Sport, which definitely feels sportier than this. There's also the Range Rover Velar, which I absolutely love. The Velar is the kind of vehicle that demands to be driven harder. You're out on your favorite winding mountain road, you're driving it along, you look down at the speedometer and you think to yourself, oh wow, I'm going 10, 15 miles an hour faster than I thought I was. This is the kind of vehicle where you are driving on your favorite winding mountain road, comfortably wafting along, getting a massage, and you look down at the speedometer and you think, oh, not even going the speed limit. But obviously with over 500 horsepower on tap, this is capable of moving pretty quickly. But it's the kind of vehicle where if you dig a little bit deeper, the vehicle says, are you sure? Are you really sure? And then it says, okay, let's go from zero to 60 in 4.3 seconds, if you want to or at least you might assume that that's what the accelerator pedal programming was designed to do. Instead, we actually get kind of a jumpy throttle pedal in this vehicle. If you drive it really gently, really carefully, and you're in the eco mode or the snow mode, then things are pretty smooth from a stop. If on the other hand, you're in the auto mode and I were just to come down here to a stop, then you have to be a little bit careful on the throttle because it can feel a little bit jumpy. Under most driving conditions, this feels big and it feels heavy, just as you'd expect. But if you really start to push it harder, it can pick up its kilt and start dancing because it has that rear wheel steering system and it's not as heavy as you might think. This model comes in at right around 5,600 pounds or so, just a little bit over. Now, depending on the options that you get, Theoretically, this could get up to maybe about 57 or 5,800 pounds, but it's always gonna be under 6,000 pounds. So it's not nearly as heavy as some of the alternatives that you might be considering against this. And that means that it handles relatively well, stops relatively quickly, but keep in mind, it only has 285 with tires on it because this is not an overtly sport missioned vehicle. So 60 to zero stopping distance, 127 feet, and I'm gonna give the handling score a B. The steering rack has a lot of precision to it, and it will certainly go around the corner faster than you might think, but it definitely has a soft and cushy ride to it. Sometimes it feels like there would be a lot of body roll, a lot of tip and dive, but the adaptive suspension that we have in this vehicle combined with the airlift springs, they really level things out, and it doesn't actually have much body roll. If you waggle the steering wheel like this, you'll notice the body is not bobbing side to side. The vehicle is really just turning side to side very, very smoothly. We also don't have much tip and dive. There's actually a little bit more tip under acceleration than there is dive under braking. But clearly, it's not as performance focused as something like a BMW X5M. But on the other hand, it does have excellent ride quality, so I'm going to give this an A+. It also has an eerily quiet cabin. I measured 69 decibels even in here at 50 miles an hour, making this among the quietest vehicles that I have ever tested. Really, really impressive considering that this is not a body on frame vehicle. It's a unibody vehicle, so there isn't that same kind of isolation that you'd find in, say, a Grand Wagoneer or something like that. A vehicle that is, oddly, not too far off this in terms of size. Obviously, this is a lot more expensive though. Some folks might scoff at the prospect of cross shopping a Range Rover and a Rolls Royce, but because those two brands have had a natural pairing for decades and decades, it makes sense that this top end model, which is certainly competing very directly with the Bentley at least, has that same sort of really quiet cabin, really comfortable ride with a lot of isolation. Perhaps the thing that surprised me the most over a week of driving this was the fuel economy. You'd expect something this big and this boxy with over 500 horsepower to be in the low teens as far as average fuel economy, but over a week I've been averaging 20.5 miles per gallon. Interesting twist, that is really, really good even when you compare this engine against the base inline six and a few other people that I know that have been able to drive both vehicles for a little bit longer back to back actually found that the fuel economy is pretty comparable one engine to the other. That's most likely why they chose this BMW partnership with this engine because BMW makes some really efficient turbocharged V8 engines. This is absolutely one of them. And it really means that if you're torn between the inline six and the V8 and you want something that feels a little bit jumpier, or a little bit peppier, 
you can get the pep without really paying too much extra at the pump. And then you can pat yourself on the back for, you know, trying to save some baby seals or something like that. Or of course you could get the plug-in hybrid inline six. I haven't driven that yet, but it's likely not going to be as smooth as this or the regular inline six because of that plug-in hybrid drivetrain. Of course, I will have to uh, leave those final opinions till I can actually get my hands on one. But bottom line out on the road, this is incredibly impressive. It's quiet, it's comfortable. I'm getting a massage at the moment. There's really very little else that I could ask for. Although I have to admit, I could ask for a slightly more comfortable driver's seat. I do find the driver's seat in this vehicle and the front passenger seat for that matter to be a little bit less comfortable than I had imagined over a longer period of driving. If you've made it this far in the video, thank you and congratulations. You can reward yourself by hitting the notification bell icon down there, making sure those are turned on. Let's talk about pricing now. Uh, if you want one of these, be prepared to pay a lot. It's gonna start at $104,500 for the base model. If you want the plug-in hybrid, that does seem like a strangely good deal at $108,400 starting. If you want the V8, that's a lot more, $122,800. Long wheelbase version with five seats, $161,600 is the starting price there because that starts at the autobiography trim. If you're simply interested in a Range Rover with three rows, then actually that's not such a bad deal, $110,500. And weirdly, any way you slice it, the three row model is a little bit less expensive than the model with just two rows in the extended wheelbase version. An autobiography version of the three row is $2,000 less expensive than the two row long wheelbase autobiography. Yeah, 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 autobiography is kind of a weird name. I don't know exactly why they do that either. Anyway, this is the SV trim. This is the most expensive way you can get your Range Rover. SV stands for Special Vehicle Operations, only they decided to drop the O, so it's just SV. It has SV logos here and here and there, and SV puddle lamps and an SV on your key as well. This started at $218,000. As equipped today, $255,000, and there are still a few options you could have added to bring this up to $265,000 if you get carried away. Now, obviously that is bonkers crazy expensive, but also strangely a good deal depending on how you want to compare this. Versus a Mercedes-Benz GLS, it can actually get up about this expensive. There's the GLS Maybach, that is pretty darn expensive. I think I would get one of these over the Maybach. It feels more special, it feels more distinctive as well. And the GLS starts a lot less expensive than the Range Rover, so there are gonna be more of them out there. Same thing with the X7, doesn't get nearly as expensive. But what about the really premium options? I was surprised a Bentley Bentayga starts at $167,000, so well within the price range of this model. I do like the interior of the Bentley more, but this is way more attractive on the outside than the Bentley. Also, the electronics are way more modern in this than the Bentley. Bentley uses kind of some last generation electronics from Audi. It really shows if you start digging into the menus. This definitely feels more modern. Same sort of old electronics problems actually in the Rolls Royce. For some reason, those manufacturers, they don't just pull the latest infotainment tech from their parent companies. Rolls Royce is owned by BMW, of course. So it gets a previous generation of the iDrive system, actually a fairly old version of iDrive. And it's gonna cost you $341,000 base. So a lot more expensive than this model right here. I can't imagine exactly which customer this would apply to, but if you find yourself being a multimillionaire, but you're also strangely on a tight budget and you could see yourself spending $265,000, but you just couldn't squeak yourself up to $350,000 or $400,000 for your next SUV, then obviously the Range Rover is gonna be an excellent option. But a little bit more seriously, not too much more seriously, mind you, because we're still talking six figures, the plug-in hybrid and the inline six versions of the Range Rover are very comfortable transportation and the addition of that three row model makes this a very solid upgrade from something like a BMW X7 or Mercedes-Benz GLS. It certainly has a more special feel to it, a more distinctive look to it, and it's also gonna be a bit rarer. So if you want a three row vehicle for your kids or whatever, whatever's going on there in the back that you need an extra third row for, and you still wanna hold your head high when you go to the country club, that's exactly what this Range Rover is all about. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. And of course, check out the related videos on the X7, the GLS, and all those other things. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, blah, 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 and I'll see all of you next week.